Let me begin with a disclaimer. The Wallace B. Smith Lecture is a tradition of the John Whitmer Historical Association, a body of historians and enthusiasts that is independent of Community of Christ. Although I'm a church leader, I'm speaking today as a historian, and this is a JWHA event rather than an official church event. Our church history principles in Community of Christ state that the church does not legislate or mandate positions on matters of church history. And so my goal tonight is to provide historical context for understanding how we as a people got to the place where we are and to inform our future journey. So this is a live interactive presentation. Michael and Leandro are here as our producers. They're monitoring your comments and questions in the chats and Facebook and YouTube, and a Q&A period will follow the formal lecture. My presentation, as Kyle mentioned, is entitled The Past, Present, and Future of the Prophetic Monarchy in the Latter-day Saint Tradition. Last year, 2022, saw the passing of both Queen Elizabeth II and the Emeritus Pope Benedict XVI. Representatives of the Western world's two most prominent monarchies. Having ascended the throne in 1952 at the age of 25, Elizabeth reigned over 70 years, longer than any monarch in British history. Elizabeth was monarch for so long that the overwhelming majority of her subjects had never experienced anyone else in the role. The Pope who died the last day of 2022, Benedict, was not the current reigning Pope. When Benedict retired from office in 2013 for age-related health reasons, he became the first Pope to do so since the year 1415, an interval of 598 years. For context, uh, the year 1415, uh, the Byzantine Roman Emperor was still uh, ruled in Constantinople, the Moors were still in Spain, and Columbus would not even be born for another quarter century. Nevertheless, Benedict's retirement was not without other modern precedents in the Catholic Church's upper leadership. Beginning in 1970, Pope Paul VI instituted an age limit for cardinals in exercising their most existential privilege. Since that time, cardinals over the age of 80 have been excluded from participation and voting in the conclave assembled to elect the new pope upon the death or resignation of his predecessor. Given the ever-increasing longevity afforded by modern medicine, the age limit for active cardinals and the introduction of a precedent for papal retirements and emeritus status seems especially healthy for an, institu for an institution, the institution of the papal monarchy and the dynamism of the Catholic Church overall. Thinking about the capacity of a church with over a billion members worldwide to exercise the self-discipline to discard six centuries or more of precedence in order to avoid rule by men far into their old age and in many cases beyond their capacity cannot help but bring to mind the contrast with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints whose ruling quorums of 15 apostles have failed to impose any such age limits on themselves. Last year, we marked the 50th anniversary of the John Whitmer Historical Association. I reflected then on the past, present, and future of the prophetic monarchy in our own Latter-day Saint tradition. Historians of our movement have made frequent use of the word kingdom, but they've been less inclined to look at the Latter-day Saint kingdom's prophetic leadership through the lens of monarchy. I think there are some insights to be gained from the comparison, especially in exploring themes including 
succession claims, sources of legitimacy, the maintenance and atrophy of inherited prerogatives, and the ability of the prophetic monarch to move a church in directions it might not otherwise have gone. In the 19th century, the majority of the world's independent states were monarchies. Large republics, including the United States, were a relatively untested phenomenon. However, then as now, the world's monarchies and republics do not neatly correspond to the spectrum dividing democracies from autocracies. The reign of Victoria, Queen of the United Kingdom and the British Empire, the world's most powerful monarchy, was increasingly constitutional. Most of the sovereign's power having passed to elected members of the British Parliament. Meanwhile, although Mexico was a republic, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, serving as its president multiple times in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, frequently dissolved elected congresses and assumed dictatorial powers. The essential difference then between monarchy and dictatorship is not seen in their relative, in their relative powers, but in their relative legitimacy. King Charles III is now uh, King of the United Kingdom and 14 other Commonwealth realms, including here in Canada, but he is heir to a dynasty that has been in place for a millennium or more. Included in his inherited role is leadership of the Church of England and the ancient claim that Britain's anointed kings rule, quote, by the grace of God. Likewise, Pope Francis, although elected to the monarchy, nevertheless bases his le le legitimacy on one, the antiquity of the papacy, and two, divine authorization. Legitimacy is a difficult bridge to gap. Gap to bridge. <laughs> because antiquity is one of the two primary sources of legitimacy, a dictatorship can slowly evolve into a monarchy through the establishment of a dynasty. In an especially ironic turnabout after three generations, the Kim dynasty of North Korea has effectively transformed a nominally socialist people's republic into a very repressive monarchy. Napoleon Bonaparte stands out as a rare example of a dictator who was relatively successful in assuming the trappings of monarchy. Coming to power as military commander in revolutionary France, Napoleon declared himself emperor in 1804 and was able to intermarry his family into Europe's established royal houses. This rare example of a dictator achieving legitimacy highlights a third potential source of legitimacy for monarchs military success. Napoleon is one of the most celebrated military commanders in all history, and yet in gaining legitimacy via the use gladii, the right of the sword, leaves uh, one open to military failure as a quick recipe for one's downfall, as was illustrated in Waterloo. By the time Joseph Smith set about organizing the kingdom of God on earth in Nauvoo, his role had already taken on many of the trappings traditional to monarchies, including claiming divine legitimacy, antiquity, and even military trappings. Divine authority was asserted from the beginning. Joseph stated that the text of the Book of Mormon was translated according to, quote, the gift and power of God. A further revelatory threshold was crossed during the crisis in 1828, when Martin Harris lost the original 116 pages of the manuscript. In response, Joseph dictated a direct answer in God's voice, an original revelation without the assertion of an ancient text as an intermediary, 
recovery of the prophetic voice became a direct assertion of divine legitimacy. Although a new creation, the Latter-day Saint movement likewise claimed antiquity from the start. Members who came together on April 6, 1830 to found the church were careful to avoid the word found. Rather, they asserted that they were merely organizing the original church that had been founded by Jesus some 1800 years previously, which had merely fallen into a state of disorganization during a period of great apostasy. The church, its priesthood and offices were understood to be a restoration of practices dating back to antiquity. In addition, the Book of Abraham, I'm sorry, the Book of Mormon offered ancient legitimacy to the Smith family as a passage identified Joseph Smith as a descendant of the biblical patriarch Joseph, the favorite son of Israel. The Latter-day Prophet built upon this idea in 1833 as he instituted the practice of giving patriarchal blessings. The blessing he bestowed upon his father, Joseph Smith Sr., included the promise that the blessings of Joseph, that is the biblical patriarch, by the hand of his progenitor, Israel, shall come upon the head of my father, Joseph Sr., and his seed after him to the uttermost. From this time forward, Joseph Sr. held the office of presiding patriarch of the church until his deathbed, when he bestowed it upon Hiram Smith, his eldest surviving son, by right of lineage. In contrast to the immediate claims of divine authority and antiquity, Joseph acquired military trappings more gradually. In response to the standoff over lands of church members that had been illegally seized by residents of Jackson County, Missouri, Joseph Smith and other leaders in Kirtland, Ohio, formed a militia called Zion's Camp. The militia's first act in May of 1834 was to name Joseph Supreme General of the Camp. Four years later, during the events of the 1838 war in Missouri, Joseph Smith assumed overall command of the Mormon militias, which were sometimes referred to collectively as the armies of Israel. Although, although both these forays into militants, the Zion's church and the 1838 war ended in debacle, church leaders took away the wrong lesson choosing to double down on militants. Regrouping in Illinois with the help of John C. Bennett, church leaders secured a charter allowing them to organize a legal unit of the state militia, which they called the Nauvoo Legion. Joseph assumed command and was commissioned with the rank of Lieutenant General, and he had a suitably fancy uniform created, which he is wearing, in this Sutcliffe Maudsley portrait, one of the few portraits that date from his lifetime. The contemporary formal fashion for European kings, including included military uniforms of a, in a similar, if more expensive style. Thus, at the time when Joseph Smith restored the kingdom of God on earth and was acclaimed its king, he already possessed an appropriate outfit. The prism of monarchy helps highlight key aspects of the 1844 succession crisis. Historically, as a general rule, the weakest moment for any monarchy is the period of transition between successive monarchs. This is why, in Britain, the heir instantly becomes monarch upon the death of his or her predecessor, and the cry rings out, the king is dead, long live the king. Thus Charles became king immediately upon his mother's death. His coronation ceremony merely recognized something that legally had already occurred. However, when the heir who comes to the throne is a minor child, they must inevitably come under the sway of a regent, 
their mother or an uncle or a powerful lord, and this has great potential to weaken the monarchy. In these periods, the king and the dynasty are especially vulnerable to usurpation. In the case of elective monarchies, like the papacy, the succession offers a chance for various power brokers, such as emperors and kings historically, to put a preferred candidate on the throne. Or, as the right of election became housed within the College of Cardinals, to secure the election of someone from your faction within the college. In some cases in the Middle Ages, the cardinals preferred to leave the papal throne vacant for two years or more in order to retain power and income for themselves. When Joseph Smith restored the kingdom, he did not set up a, constitutional, a constitution with a set of rules for the succession. Nothing in the laws of the church, canonized in the Book of Doctrine and Covenants, outline a procedure to follow in the case of the death of the prophet. Well, Brigham Young, as president of the Council of Twelve, and William Marks, as president of the presiding high council, are often cited as having strong claims. Scripture does not designate either office as heir to the prophet. Nor was the body of the newly restored kingdom, the Council of Fifty, equipped with succession procedures. Members of that council were ranked by age, but Joseph Smith as leader was himself the exception, outranking all, despite being younger than many seniors. Finally, although Joseph Smith predicted many times that his son would one day, like him, be a prophet, he laid out no such hereditary rule in the Doctrine and Covenants. Joseph Smith's assassination on June 27, 1844, left the Nauvoo Kingdom in disarray. Hiram Smith, who held the role of Assistant President of the Church, was killed alongside his brother. Samuel Smith, the next eldest brother, died within a month, leaving only William alive among his generation of male Smiths. And in addition to being relatively unpopular, William initially remained in the East and thus outside of the calculus of church headquarters. While there seems to be a general view, even acknowledged by Brigham Young that Joseph III would one day succeed to his father's offices, in June of 1844, he was still an 11-year-old boy. Perhaps for this reason, both leading factions at headquarters rejected the idea of choosing an immediate successor. Sidney Rigdon, leader of the anti-polygamy faction, rather than claiming the prophetic mantle directly, proposed instead that he be named guardian of the church. So traditionally in England and Scotland, guardian of the realm is one of the titles assumed by the regent ruling in the name of a child monarch. Brigham Young, the leader of the pro-polygamy faction, offered a similar counterproposal. Rather than putting himself forward as the new prophet, he argued that the Council of Twelve should be allowed to act as the church's first presidency, in effect creating a regency council rather than a sole regent. Young's arguments, of course, prevailed, and Rigdon soon felt the need to flee Nauvoo for Pittsburgh, where he organized a short-lived rival headquarters. The triumph of the polygamy faction made peace with the Illinoisans impossible, and it also led to a permanent rift between Young's organization and Joseph's widow, Emma Hale Smith. When Young led his followers west, Emma and her family remained behind. In monarchy, losing control of the heir almost inevitably leads to the downfall of the regent. While Young's maneuver of vesting leadership in the Council of Twelve had the effect of keeping leaders like Apostle Lyman White, Bishop George Miller, and Council of Fifty member Alphaeus Cutler in communion with his faction, by 1847, 
he felt sufficiently well established in his de facto leadership to assume the prophetic mantle for himself. So in studying monarchies, terms like usurper and pretender have meanings that are technical and descriptive. And we should point out that all the, though the, both terms actually have negative connotations, not all usurpers are bad monarchs. For example, William the Conqueror usurped the throne from King Harold, but William is generally viewed as a strong and effective king who transformed England and set it on its course. King William III and Mary II of England jointly usurped the throne from her father, King James II, in a very popular revolution in 1689 that historians remember as glorious. While Richard III is remembered as a villain for usurping the throne from his young nephew, Edward V, in 1483, Henry Tudor, who usurped Richard's throne two years later, is generally credited with ending the War of the Roses and restoring peace and stability to England. So nevertheless, whether they end up being a good monarch or a bad monarch, usurpers all sit less securely in their roles than other monarchs because of their relative deficit of legitimacy. In addition, opponents have a ready-made vehicle for contesting the reign. So while William the Conqueror quickly secured the realm after his victory at Hastings, he faced later uprisings by noblemen championing the claims of the heir to the old Anglo-Saxon dynasty. Opponents to William and Mary looked to a restoration of James II, who was called the Old Pretender, and later his son, Bonnie Trince, Prince Charlie, who is titled the Young Pretender, as, and, they, and the pretender Henry Tudor was only able to successfully press his relatively weak claim to the throne against Richard III because of Richard's own weak position as a usurper and likely the murderer of his nephews, the princes in the tower. So this second term, pretender then, despite some potentially negative connotations, technically refers to a person who claims to be the rightful ruler of a kingdom whose throne he or she does not, in fact, possess. So, in 1847, by reorganizing a first presidency and claiming for himself the role of prophet and president of the church, I argue that Brigham Young took on the role in monarchical terms of a usurper. Thereafter, he faced some of the same insecurities shared by historic monarchs who seize rather than inherit their thrones. While Brigham Young faced initial rivals in the Midwest and Eastern United States, in the decade after relocating his followers to the Great Basin in the beginning, of 18, beginning in 1847, he was able to build up his kingdom with few serious internal rivals. And while some members of the church in Utah may have originally held out hope that Joseph III or one of his brothers might ultimately make their way west and join the leadership, this became increasingly unlikely due to the younger generation of Smith's open and fierce opposition to the practice of polygamy. In this period, Brigham Young Sr. seems to have entertained the idea of founding a new ruling dynasty that is replacing the absent principal branch of the Smith family with his own family. In 1855 and again in 1864, he secretly ordained Brigham Young Jr. and two of his other young sons as apostles and as counselors in his first presidency. The fact that Young kept these ordinations secret even from his own apostles indicates that he correctly anticipated significant opposition from within their ranks. Meanwhile, on April 6, 1860, Joseph Smith III came before a general conference of Latter-day Saints gathered in Amboy, Illinois, to claim his father's mantle and to be ordained as prophet and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
At the same time, this new organization or reorganization of the church in the Midwest could claim the allegiance of just a few hundred souls. Joseph III thus took the titles of prophet and president of the church without controlling any more than a very tiny faction, tiny fraction of the movement's members. So through the lens of monarchy, in my view, he therefore became a pretender to Brigham Young's throne. The threat posed by this new young pretender was real. In addition to the prophecies that he would one day take his father's place, Joseph III re resembled his father, sounded like his father, and even shared his father's name. Old members fractured in the many Latter-day Saint factions other than Young's largely rallied to Joseph III's banner. Even groups that had embraced polygamy saw their members joining in the new organization. In contrast to these rival organizations, Young's church had prospered in the Great Basin and his own control was secure. Nevertheless, Young's strong personality and strong hand had generated some enemies and potential opponents who might not mourn his downfall. In normal circumstances, a diverse opposition is unable to unite around any individual factional leader. For this reason, a pretender poses a unique threat. Suddenly, there is a clear banner around which uh, can rally all of the potential opponents to the current monarch. And the pretender has potential to draw to his cause people who might otherwise have been content with the status quo. When missionaries for the new organization, for the reorganization, including Joseph III and his brothers, traveled to Utah to press their claims, Young took the potential threat seriously, acting to shore up his own legitimacy claims while undercutting the Smith family. It is in this era that Young's supporters began to remember and articulate a shared vision that they said had taken place during the speech he gave in Nauvoo decades earlier on August 8, 1844. While contemporary accounts speak of a sense that the mantle had truly fallen upon the Twelve, recollections in the 1860s anachronistically reconstruct the memory as a vision that Young had been transfigured into the image of Joseph Smith, Jr. Young also brought to the fore his own loyalists within the Smith family. Hiram's son, Joseph F. Smith, had traveled west and established a large polygamous household. Young set him to follow his cousins to remind the membership that the Utah church had its own Smiths who recognized Brigham Young as the true prophet and president. When few in Utah were ultimately persuaded to support the pretender's bid to the prophetic monarchy, I think Joseph III had only himself to blame. His primary focus was never to free the people from Young's perceived tyranny. Rather, his goal, first and foremost, was to morally condemn polygamy. And his next goal was like unto it to clear his father's name from association with polygamy. For people in Utah, many of whom had intimate personal knowledge that Joseph Smith Jr. had indeed instituted and practiced plural marriage, Joseph III's claims to the contrary undercut his credibility as a prophet. For the rest, even if they could go so far as to agree that polygamy had been a mistake, their family structures were inextricably entangled with the practice. Polygamy is the one topic around which Joseph III failed to exercise his characteristic pragmatism. Had he been more open-minded in listening to the testimony of women who had been engaged with his father in polygamy and others with first-hand knowledge, he could have arrived at a more honest position on the topic. Had he listened with more empathy to Latter-day Saints, including those inimical to Brigham Young, 
whose polygamous families were nevertheless an established fact, his challenge to Young's leadership might have had markedly different results. Instead, he sacrificed any such possibility to achieve his own goals of morally condemning Mormon polygamy while closing his eyes to his father's inception of the practice. Thus, Joseph III returned to the Midwest and built up his own smaller, rival, reorganized kingdom. With the pretender vanquished, Young's reign was now fully secure, but defending against the challenge had not come without a cost. The elevation of loyalist Smiths was a blow to Young's own hopes for establishing his own Young family dynasty. In 1866, Hiram's son Joseph F. Smith was made an apostle and an assistant counselor in Young's first presidency. Some now in Utah became hopeful that Joseph F. Smith might eventually fill the role as Young's prophetic successor. More importantly, the need to retroactively legitimize Young's own succession undermined his hopes for establishing a dynasty. If the prophetic monarchy should indeed pass from father to son, from Brigham Sr. to Brigham Jr., then why had it ever passed to Brigham Sr. in the first place? By asserting that his succession as senior most apostle, senior most apostle was the legitimate constitutional path, Young effectively named his own senior most apostle as his legitimate heir. When Young died in 1877, these questions were still open, causing a delay of over two years in ordaining a successor as a prophet and president of the Utah LDS Church. Eventually, John Taylor, the senior most apostle, after some earlier jostling of ranks, won out and formed a new first presidency that included Joseph F. Smith as a counselor. Taylor also successfully forced Brigham Young Jr. to turn over to the church most of his father's vast estates, which had been intermingled with church property during his father's rule, under threat of expulsion from the Quorum of Apostles. By co-opting Joseph F. Smith and suppressing Brigham Jr., Taylor eliminated the threat that a dynasty might gain and retain control of the Utah church's prophetic monarchy. Brigham Jr. remained in the quorum, but his rank was subsequently adjusted to prevent him from succeeding in 1901 via apostolic seniority. Never again has any Utah church president appointed an apostle with the last name Young. In 1901, Joseph F. Smith did succeed as prophet and president of the Utah church. During his presidency, Joseph F. added his cousin George Albert Smith and his son, Joseph Fielding Smith, to the Quorum of Apostles. And while they each, in turn, eventually succeeded to the presidency through apostolic succession, neither named a Smith to the Quorum. The last components of dynastic rule in, Utah, in the Utah Church were extinguished when the Church's presiding patriarch, Eldridge G. Smith, a great-great-grandson of Hiram Smith, was given emeritus status in 1979. His position and calling was discontinued by the church upon his death in 2013. In part, because of Brigham Young's reactions to the threat of Joseph III pretending to his throne, the succession in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has become permanently fixed. Upon the death of the prophet and president of the church, the first presidency is immediately dissolved and the counselors return to their previous ranks within the Quorum of Apostles. The senior most apostle now becomes the president of the church and forms his own first presidency. Why does the first presidency dissolve automatically? There's nothing in the Doctrine and Covenants to suggest that the first presidency dissolves upon the death of the prophet but it dissolves in the LDS Church ritually in order to retroactively legitimize Brigham Young's succession. Why does the senior most apostle automatically succeed? Again, 
It does so to give Brigham Young's own usurpation, retroactive legitimacy. This strategy has proven extremely effective. Succession of the senior most apostle is unquestioned in the Utah tradition, and the system seems very unlikely to change. Nevertheless, there also does not seem to be much hope of a cure for the side effect of this system, which is rule by a prophet who is inevitably extremely aged. The institution of the prophetic monarchy has had a significantly different trajectory and evolution in the reorganized tradition. Over the course of Joseph III's 54-year tenure as prophet and president, the membership grew rapidly from a few hundred in 1860 to some 73,899 in 1914, the year of his death. Initial growth came from the regathering of the old saints scattered in the various dissenting factions, former Strangites, Williamites, Whiteites, Cutlerites, Thompsonites, Brooksites, and more. In the years since 1844, each of these groups had walked their own path and added their own distinctives to the Restoration tradition. The Strangites, for example, had an additional book of scripture, and they had become Seventh-day Sabbatarians. So the only thing all of these groups had in common is that they were all made up of dissenters. These were those folks who declined to recognize the Twelves takeover of the headquarters organization and or to join in their movement west from Nauvoo to Salt Lake. Ultimately, even those followers of Brigham Young who left his church to join the reorganization either directly or via a dissenting group like the Morrisites, they were also dissenters. From the start, therefore, Joseph Smith III took control of a church that was much, much more difficult to hold together than the one Brigham Young retained control of. For dissenters who have already lived through schism, dissent is an option that always remains on the table. In addition to this limitation, the reorganization retained a few of the early church's checks and balances that atrophied in the LDS church. As we've seen, the first presidency in the Utah tradition became an extension of the Quorum of Apostles, and other headquarters councils, such as the presiding bishopric, the presiding patriarch, and the standing high council, were either subordinated uh, uh, to, the 12, to the 15 apostles or eliminated. In contrast, in the RLDS Church, the First Presidency and the Council of Apostles continued to be in completely distinct councils. And on occasion, the Presidency has had to struggle with the Council of Apostles and the presiding bishopric to define each leadership's body, each leadership's body's scope of control. For example, while the bishopric's authority is traditionally limited to control of the church's temporal assets, this can, in theory, become very extensive as budgets, resources, and property are essential components to mission programming. Nevertheless, the right of the prophet president to appoint members of the leading councils sets practical limits on their autonomy. And in contrast to the Utah tradition, where apostles generally enjoy lifetime tenure, all officers in the reorganized tradition effectively serve at the will of the president who can choose to release them from their callings. This prerogative has sometimes been used aggressively. The young prophet Frederick Madison Smith inherited his father's old guard, leaders used to the way things that had been run for more than half a century. Fred M grew impatient of the opposition and during the 1922 General Conference released four older apostles and appointed six new apostles, a degree of turnover unimaginable in the Utah tradition. In addition, Joseph III and his successors have retained an even more potent prerogative that was lost by Brigham Young's apostolic heirs. Joseph Smith Jr.'s restoration of the prophetic voice, the dictation of revelations to the church, 
was at the foundation of the early church's claims to legitimacy. However, this was not a practice that Young felt confident imitating. Only one such revelation through Young was ever added to the Utah Doctrine and Covenants, and except for the text of a vision by Joseph F. Smith, none of the revelations dictated by any of Young's successors have been added as sections. By contrast, Joseph Smith III and every one of his prophetic successors have brought inspired counsel to the church, to community of Christ and the reorganization, which the church through its general or later world conferences has canonized as revelations added to community of Christ doctrine and covenants. Not infrequently, this prerogative has been wielded as the ultimate trump card by prophet presidents in conflict. The assertion that their preferred course of action is affirmed by God. To forward his expansive social gospel vision, the prophet Fred M. Smith vied with the presiding bishopric and some members of the Council of Apostles, asserting in joint council documents that the presidency enjoyed, quote, supreme directional control, unquote, over the church. When these documents were approved by the 1925 General Conference, the presiding bishopric resigned in protest. Fred M. backed up his position by dictating a revelation that became Doctrine and Covenants section 135, which affirms, quote, it is well that the documents from the Joint Council of April 1924 have been approved, unquote. The prophetic voice has been employed in attempts to answer numerous controversies from the baptism of polygamists in Africa and India to priesthood ordination restrictions on the basis of race, gender, and sexual orientation. Joseph III and his successors have had a few other advantages as prophetic monarchs that their Utah counterparts have lacked. Having been appointed to the role by his father through multiple blessings and being his father's son, Joseph III inherited legitimacy from day one in the eyes of his followers. In the popular understanding of the reorganized tradition, appointment by the predecessor and Smith family lineage became the twin pillars of legitimacy on which the prophetic monarchy rested. As we've seen, the Book of Mormon endowed the Smith family with an august patriarchal lineage during the succession crisis when Joseph III's uncle, William Smith, attempted to promote his own claim to the prophetic mantle, he developed ideas of lineal succession. William self-servingly argued that as the office of presiding patriarch passed within the Smith line, so too should the office of prophet president. William even pointed out the biblical example that after Jesus' death, Leadership of the church in Jerusalem passed not to Peter, the leader of the apostles, but to James, the brother of Jesus. Although William's organization expelled him and later fell apart, Williamite leaders, including Apostle Jason Briggs, converted to the doctrine of lineal succession, became central to the formation of the reorganization. For Joseph III himself, however, Prophetic appointment was the crucial pillar, as it had the sole bit of guidance in the church's canon law. Doctrine and Covenants, section 43, verse 2a, reads, quote, None else shall be appointed unto this gift except it be through him, that is, through Joseph Smith's uh, father, the founder, Joseph Smith Jr., for if it had been taken from him, he shall not have any power except to appoint another in his stead." Unquote. So, for his part, in contrast to his father's vague and sometimes contradictory statements about succession, Joseph III wrote a clear letter of instruction outlining his own views on the succession going forward. In appointing a successor, Joseph III did not consider himself limited to choosing from among Smith family heirs. Indeed, his counselor in the First Presidency, R.C. Evans, strongly believed that Joseph III would appoint him as heir. 
In this hope, however, R.C. Evans was disappointed as Joseph III followed the precedent of appointment within the Smith family, naming his son Fred M. to succeed him. Fred M. in turn appointed his brother Israel A. Smith, who appointed his half-brother W. Wallace Smith. W. Wallace appointed his son Wallace B. and additionally created a precedent for stepping down in his own lifetime and assuming the role of prophet emeritus. That same precedent of retiring was followed by Wallace B. Smith when he appointed as his successor W. Grant McMurray, the first non-Smith in line to become prophet and president of the church. The succession process in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has caused the prophetic monarchy to evolve into something more akin to a corporate oligarchy whose successive aged leaders have little energy or time to make significant changes during their administrations. Brigham Young has had 15 successors. The average tenure of an LDS president is about 10 years. In that same time, Joseph III has had just six successors, and the average tenure of a president of the reorganization has been a little over 23 years. This longer duration of their administrations has given our LDS presidents more opportunity to make significant changes in their church's direction. And this is only enhanced by the fact that they come to office so much younger than their LDS counterparts. So we might point out here that before he went on an extended medical leave, President Stephen M. Vesey had announced his intention to retire from his role as prophet and president of Community of Christ in 2025. And even then, though, even now, he, today, he is at age 66, younger than all but one of the 15 LDS apostles. So the least senior LDS apostle, Ulysses Soares, is currently a ripe young 65-year-old. As a result, prophets and presidents in the RLDS tradition have been able to function as much more dynamic monarchs than their LDS counterparts. In his pragmatic 53-year reign, Joseph III was able to slowly wade out and outlive rival viewpoints and roll the church back, not only from the divergent distinctives of the factional period, but also back past the excesses of Nauvoo, focusing the church on a shared Kirtland-era vision that fit theologically more comfortably within Christian orthodoxy. Joseph III's successor, Fred M., illustrates the power of a visionary and willful monarch to lead a people far past their comfort zone. While much of the church Fred M. inherited were likely content to dwell in polemics of a bygone era, he sought to renew and update the church through a vision of Zion expanded from agricultural co-ops to include the social gospel of senior housing, hospitals, and colleges. Unfortunately, Fred M's default response to opposition was autocratic, leading to serious dissent within church leadership councils and schism among members. Nevertheless, his bold vision, coupled with his force of will, reinvented the church that he had inherited. Fred M's successor, Israel A, by contrast, was far less ambitious, presiding during America's post-Depression, post-World War II boom, when the LDS Church began experiencing remarkable growth, the potential may have been present for similar RLDS gains had investments been made at this critical moment. Instead, Israel's ambitions were much more conservative and limited, pay off debts and finish the job of building the auditorium, more international expansion began during the tenure of Israel A's successor, W. Wallace Smith. However, this did not apparently grow out of W. Wallace's personal vision or agenda. Rather, lacking a program of his own, W. Wallace allowed energetic and progressive leaders in the First Presidency and Council of the Twelve to drive the program. As a result, headquarters moved the church in a direction more progressive than the prophet. The progressive direction accelerated with the succession of W. Wallace's son, Wallace B. Smith, who employed the prophetic voice 
to end the church's policy of priesthood discrimination on the basis of gender. The Inspire Council presented to the church in 1984, which was canonized as Doctrine and Covenants 156, also included a call to begin building the long-awaited temple in Independence, Missouri. So while he might have hoped that the church's progressive and traditionalist factions might be led to work together in this new positive endeavor, women's ordination proved a bridge too far too soon for the traditionalists. Following the reorganization's dissenting, react, uh, reaction, uh, dissenting tradition, uh, reactionaries rejected the prophet and his revelation, leaving the church in a significant schism. Wallace B. ended his tenure with yet another unprecedented step forward. As we've seen, Joseph III based his own legitimacy on appointment rather than lineage, but for the first 136 years of the reorganization, that principle had never been tested. Asserting that God was now calling prophets from outside the Smith family, Wallace B. appointed W. Grant McMurray as his successor in 1995. The choice was ratified by the 1996 World Conference, and Grant was ordained prophet and president of the church. Grant continued to urge the church forward along its progressive path, calling for transformation and articulating a more positive identity. As the name reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with its unofficial moniker, We're Not the Mormons, uh, had come to embody what the church was not, Grant led the church to adopt a new name, Community of Christ, that embodies who we are, a church committed to living out Christ's mission in sacred community. Amid the slow deconstruction of a negative identity, therefore, efforts were made at the construction of a positive identity. Like his predecessor, Grant may have been a prophet who was more progressive than the general membership of the church he led. When questioned in the 1990s about ongoing injustice, the ongoing injustice of the church's discriminatory policies regarding the ordination of gay and lesbian members, Grant admitted that he had personally violated these policies and that he asked the church to be willing to live on the boundary for a while. But this admission led to a backlash among remaining reactionaries who threatened further dissent and schism. Headquarters relented, and historian William D. Russell has argued that this incident may have set back the cause of inclusion by many years. While Grant was the first president of the church, whose legitimacy rested uh, on just one of the prophetic monarchy's two traditional pillars, that is, he succeeded to his role by prophetic appointment, but he was not a member of the Smith dynasty, the revelations he brought to the church endowed it with a revolutionary new source of legitimacy, in my view, a pivotal game changer. The words of counsel Grant presented to the church, canonized in the year 2000 as Doctrine and Covenants section 161, called upon, quote, this people to prophetically witness. DNC 162, the next section began, listen, O ye people of the restoration you who would become a prophetic people. Grant then endowed the church with the idea that they were not merely a people with a prophet, but that they should become a prophetic people. From the earliest days in the 1830s, there had always been a tension between the principle that all things should be done by common consent of the membership, while simultaneously one person alone presides and employs the prophetic office to provide inspired counsel to the whole body. While the prophetic monarchy in the RLDS tradition retained that powerful prerogative in contrast to its LDS counterpart, the privileges of being organized by common consent were also more jealously guarded in the reorganization. Thus, congregations and community of Christ have continued to elect their pastors and manage their own budgets and priorities through local business meetings, while the role of church members in LDS ward conferences is merely to affirm the calling of bishops and priorities appointed from above. 
The same dynamic has played out in the general conferences of the two churches. In the LDS Church, conference has become a venue for the apostolic leadership to announce and showcase their priorities and decisions, while the role of the membership is to watch and affirm. General conferences in the reorganization, now renamed World Conference, have followed a different trajectory. Delegates are elected to conduct the business of the church, and their decisions can never be taken as a foregone conclusion by church offices, officers. Since the conferences of the reorganization began in the early 1850s, some seven years before the ordination of Joseph III, the democratic institution of World Conference has been maintained as a potential check and balance on the authority of the church president. Grant's articulation of the membership as a prophetic people provides inspiration for a more constitutional prophetic monarchy. Instead of operating as a kingdom ruled by a monarch drawing his legitimacy from inherited membership in a holy dynasty and or via prior prophetic appointment, the church might someday become a sacred commonwealth in which a prophetic people discern together and operate by common consent. The potential capacity of Grant's vision was unexpectedly put to the test on November 29, 2004, when he abrupt, abruptly resigned as church prophet and president without naming a successor. Six months later, on June 3, 2005, Stephen M. Steve Vesey was ordained prophet and president of the church at a special world conference called specifically for the purpose. Because Steve had been serving as president of the Council of Twelve Apostles, casual observers immediately jumped to the conclusion that Community of Christ had now come to follow the same path taken long ago by Brigham Young during the 1844 succession crisis. But the coincident, while the coincidence is striking, the comparison is superficial. Brigham Young owed his rank among the apostles to the fact that the original apostles had been ranked in order by age, and in 1844, Young was the senior most living apostle who remained a member of the church. Members of Community of Christ Council of, apostles, Council of the Twelve, by contrast, elect their own president without regard to seniority or age. Thus, although Steve Vesey had been serving in the role at the time, of his ascension as church presidents, many of the apostles were older and more senior. Nor is there any notion at all that Steve's successor will automatically be the current president of the Council of Twelve. Although, uh, as the current president of the Council of Twelve is Mareva Arnaud, she would be very, very qualified indeed. In short, the essentials of the system of automatic succession by the senior most apostle which serves to fully legitimize the LDS Church president and to fully define the LDS Church remains entirely absent in the Community of Christ context. In other words, Steve Vesey did not draw his legitimacy from his previous position as president of the Council of Twelve. At the same time, he became the first prophet ordained to lack both of the Church's two traditional sources of legitimation, membership in the Smith family and prophetic appointment. Instead, Steve's legitimacy was founded upon the vision that Grant articulated of a prophetic people discerning together to achieve common consent. Upon Grant's resignation, the remaining members of the First Presidency, which does not automatically dissolve in the community of Christ tradition upon the death or incapacity of the prophet, the First Presidency called upon the membership of the church worldwide to discern together on the question of who God was calling to lead the church. In his own tenure as prophet and president, Steve further, uh, nurtured, furthered the process of nurturing the church's emerging positive identity. Gathering a bold and diverse group of international church leaders, he led a thoughtful discernment process that resulted in the articulation of a set of enduring principles. Steve's appointments to the Council of Twelve have been intentionally inclusive 
of voices in the international church. And today, more than half the membership of the Council of Twelve hails from outside the United States for the first time in church history. And under Steve's leadership, the church has taken additional steps forward along the path of ending discrimination. The words of counsel he presented to the church in 2010, canonized as DNC 164, included a compromise on the issue of LGBTQ inclusion. While the policies of the international denomination remained in place, individual regions of the church were authorized to hold national conferences to develop local policies. Notwithstanding this progress, in contrast to his two immediate predecessors, Steve's tenure can in some ways be seen as the pendulum shifting somewhat back with a slowdown in the pace of change. From the 1990s to the present, gay and lesbian acceptance has, been, has experienced a sea change across the Western world. If Grant's moves back in a much different era were arguably premature and threatened a backlash of dissent, Steve's have arguably been not merely slow, but too slow. Certainly for LGBTQ members, forced to bear the church's discriminatory policies alongside, alongside progressives alienated by participating in ongoing injustice, the 2010 compromise itself came later than it could have. The slow work of arranging national conferences has set the calendar further back. That these conferences have resulted in supermajorities supporting inclusion with relatively few losses due to dissent, illustrates in hindsight that a quicker pace was possible. We just had news that uh, one of the most recent of these has occurred just a couple days ago in French Polynesia, where a national conference has voted 80% or so to uh, end LGBTQ discrimination. Be that as it may, the years have continued to lapse without any further progress uh, in terms of the denominational, um, where the denominational policy is at, meaning that the relatively slow pace has effectively ground to a halt. For context, 13 years after women were first ordained to priesthood, the first two women were called into the Council of Twelve, and we're now 14 years past uh, 2010, I guess 20, 13 years past 2010, and no similar calls have been extended to any openly gay or lesbian member of the church nor is it even clear that such calls are possible because while national councils have enabled local jurisdictions of the church, including the Anglo-American heartlands to be affirming, the international denomination as a whole retains discrimination as its default policy. Thus, a local transgender member here in Canada might have their identity affirmed by their local welcoming congregation and mission center only to find their essential being denied or at least passed over in silence uh, when they visit international headquarters. Leaving discrimination as the default has ongoing consequences. While the website for Community of Christ in Canada can assure members and seekers that the national church here is LGBTQ affirming, no such assurances are possible for seekers in the United States where the international website, with its silence on the issue, and therefore tacit policy of exclusion, functions as the USA national website. So, in my view, we are long past time when the church should have taken its next step forward on this issue. That is, having moved from a fully discriminatory church to one where the default policy internationally is discrimination, while some regions are tolerant, we must now move to a place where the default policy of the denomination is inclusion, while nevertheless allowing some regions of the church internationally to continue to discriminate internally. While the programs of Wallace B. Smith and Grant McMurray may have been too progressive to hold together the relatively more conservative church they led, there are indications that Steve's more cautious approach has been too conservative for the relatively more, more progressive church he has led. Even if this is the case, his caution has been understandable. It is human nature to be on guard 
and to fight the previous great battle while being ill-prepared to anticipate current needs. There is little doubt that our LDS leaders emerged from the schismatic fallout of the 1980s in a state of shell stock, shell shock. Dissenters protested with their pocketbooks, withholding tithing donations to the World Church. As a result, headquarters became hypersensitive to any potential repeat. Thus, every threat by the dwindling number of the remaining traditionalists to withhold tithing in protest of headquarters Move, uh, to have headquarters moves receives disproportionate attention and sway. Similarly, perhaps because of ongoing reverberations of the reaction to Grant's admission that he was not enforcing unjust policies of the church, in Steve's tenure, rules on the books have often been enforced zealously. So let me just share just one example here in the past decade in Canada. It has long been observed that members of younger generations, Gen X, Millennials, Gen Z, are substantially less likely to engage in weekly congregational worship than their predecessors. Nevertheless, many in these generational, generational cohorts experience and treasure Community of Christ identity through our tradition of annual camping reunions. A group of innovative, mostly younger members connecting through reunions organize themselves in the hope of discerning a way to maintain their community through the year. Spread apart geographically, they named their group Community Place Plus and pioneered a new kind of online worship via video conferencing. And so while many of us have become familiar with this kind of worship experience in the years since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, this was altogether new back in the early 2010s. Community place meetings included sharing the sacrament of communion together online. So this too is something most of us in Community of Christ have now experienced and treasured in our lives. But at the time when this group of young, engaged Canadians pioneered the practice, it was technically against church rules. And the instant an apostle from international headquarters learned that it was happening, she immediately shut it down and forbade community place from sharing the sacrament again in this way. So this is just one example, but this has been, in my experience, the default headquarters reaction to policy enforcement. Why wasn't flexibility possible? Couldn't headquarters have given a limited provisional authorization to this group of engaged young people as a testing incubator, especially given that their experiment became church policy less than a decade later. Unfortunately, this response and similar legalistic enforcement of church priesthood rules have had the effect of alienating a vast number of our young people from the sacraments, from the priesthood, and from the church itself. Losing the upcoming generations means that Community of Christ congregations across our traditional heartlands are growing ever smaller, older, and grayer before finally closing, which they are doing in large numbers. The church in North America is on the verge of demographic collapse. Nevertheless, this collapse is not occurring in a vacuum. It is set against the backdrop of the general rapid decline of Christian adherents across the Western world. But even within a collapsing marketplace, opportunities exist, especially for a relatively small denomination. The number of converts needed to make a significant difference in the future trajectory of the church is very small. If we authentically live out our principles as a church, I believe that we have the potential to attract earnest seekers not only those who have left the LDS church in large numbers, but those leaving fundamentalist Christianity in numbers that are vastly greater. The potential may have been present during Steve Vesey's tenure to have alienated less of our youth and to have attracted more seekers. But as with Israel A. Smith's decision to pay down debt rather than invest in a potential boom, international headquarters has routinely chosen to mollify the shrinking pool of aging tithe payers 
rather than risk losing them to dissent, even though this has meant alienating much of the small remaining youthful cohorts who admittedly pay much less tithing, while simultaneously undercutting any potential the church possesses to appeal to new converts. So, as I conclude, a little over a year ago, when I was invited to give the Wallace B. Smith lecture and propose this topic, I had no insider information that President Vesey would announce and set a date for his retirement. But I had done the math, and I looked at the historical precedents, and I estimated that such an announcement would likely come sooner than later, which caused me to think about the path ahead, both for the church and for Steve's eventual successor. How would the question of legitimacy play into the succession? As we've seen, Brigham Young's heirs have achieved an unassailable position by scrupulously and ritually reenacting his succession pathway. And in doing so, they have retroactively totally legitimized his succession to the prophetic monarchy. Steve, meanwhile, has been the first prophet and president in Community of Christ to lack either of the church's traditional pillars of legitimacy. He's not a smith and he did not succeed to his position by prophetic appointment. Instead, he was the first prophet and president of the church to find legitimacy through a new path, and as a result of a prophetic people engaging together in a discernment process. But to make that path real, to make it more than pretext, it seemed to be, seems to me to be necessary that Steve's successor emerge through a similar process and that the church take another step forward in becoming a prophetic people. And then by ritually reenacting the process that led to Steve's calling, the church could retroactively legitimize his ascension, accession. And so when Steve announced his retirement, I was initially very heartened that his successor would be chosen by a church-wide discernment process. However, reading the fine print of his original proposal left me more so skeptical. Yes, we were all invited to pray and thoughtfully consider this weighty matter together as a prophetic people, but Steve indicated that the final step of the process would be his unilateral decision. He would appoint his own successor. Given the background and analysis that I presented today, I was worried that this process, had it been enacted as proposed, would not be effective in conveying legitimacy upon Steve's successor. Worse, it might have retroactively delegitimized Steve's own succession. After all, he himself never enjoyed prophetic appointment. In addition, creating a church-wide discernment process that includes the input of peop the people in name only inevitably has had the effect of and, uh, of highlighting the nominal nature of the church-wide discernment process 20 years ago, when the actual selection was made by the Council of Apostles. So this was, the thing, this was where things stood last April when I gave the original version of this address at JWHA's spring meeting at the inauguration of the Community of Christ World Conference. However, in the months since, two sad events have occurred which bear directly on my thesis, on the discernment process, and on the prophetic succession. So President Vizi was hospitalized on July 27th. While the details of his condition have been kept private by the family, it was serious enough that he's not been seen publicly since, nor has he released a statement in his own name. In accordance with Community of Christ precedent, Stacy Cram and Scott Murphy have continued to function as the First Presidency, which does not dissolve. And in September, they announced that President Vesey would continue to be on a medical leave until April of next year. Steve's absence necessitated a change in the succession process. The First Presidency canceled his original plan to unilaterally choose a successor and made the decision to return to the blueprint the church followed during the 2004-2005 period when Grant resigned. Thus, responsibility for the choice of Steve's successor has now been vested in the Council of Twelve Apostles.
Let's see. Here we are. This was an important development for the church. Although we're not stepping forward necessarily as a prophetic people, we are no longer on track to step backward. In my view, unilateral appointment of a successor would have been a serious mistake. And I'm hopeful that in the course of the discernment process, Steve might have perceived that as an error in his initial plan and adopted this course or perhaps one that is even more progressive for our journey as a people. Regardless, our thoughts and prayers continue to be with him and his family during his medical leave. As I've shown, the legitimacy of the prophetic monarchy in the community of Christ has traditionally lasted on these two, these two pillars. So prophetic appointment was not available to Steve. It had been toppled when he succeeded without having been appointed by either Grant or failing that, what still might have been possible at the time, appointment by the prophet emeritus, Wallace B. Smith. Attempting to re-erect that pillar, I think, would have had a delegitimizing effect. The need to find legitimacy in the new pillar, the discernment of the entire church worldwide acting as a prophetic people, became all the more clear to me in the wake of the second sad event of the past few months. On September 22, 2023, Prophet Emeritus Wallace B. Smith passed away at the age of 94. It is staggering to me that a church founded nearly two centuries ago had still counted among its emeritus leaders a man who is the great-grandson of the founder, Joseph Smith, Jr. When I speak of my ancestors who joined the church in 1833, these are my great great great, great grandparents. Wallace B. Smith was three generations closer to his founding ancestor. Although neither Grant nor Steve were Smiths and lacked the legitimacy of the prophetic monarchy's traditional Smith family pillar, it's only really with Wallace's death that we begin to feel how much his continuing presence provided that missing support. Now that he is gone, it's clear that the prophet presidents of the church going forward will need the legitimacy of true, of true global discernment process. The succession roadmap this time, as amended by the first presidency, at least expands the choice from a single appointment to a shared discernment by 12 leaders, the Council of Apostles. This is significant because, as I've mentioned, we currently enjoy the most diverse council of the Twelve in any time in the Church's history. While the number of qualified candidates for the presidency remains narrow, instead of being chosen by one middle-aged, white, cis-hetero, Southern American man, the choice now rests in a diverse community of leaders. The council is equally divided by gender, with six women and six men. While five are Americans, the majority, seven hail from outside the U.S., including apostles from Zimbabwe, Zambia, Wales, Polynesia, Honduras, the Dominican Republic, and Canada. God may yet inspire them to choose the same person that Steve would have been inspired to choose, but the amended process will now afford the candidate greater legitimacy. Going forward, it will be important for the next prophet president to help the church develop our succession process so that our worldwide discernment becomes less nominal and more meaningful. We need our prophetic monarchy to become more constitutional. While I appreciate the trusting people to make thoughtful, critical, meaningful, and ex existential decisions for the church is terribly difficult and may indeed require a leap of faith, it is my belief that the church and its leaders need to arrive at this place for all our sakes. As a society, we are long past a time when we have much tolerance for inherited monarchy. As a Canadian, I think I'm not alone in finding it very strange and not particularly comforting to be a subject of Charles III, King of Canada. The faith of Americans in lifetime appointments to leadership positions 
for people who are then free to operate without any oversight and accountability, as for example, the US justices of the US Supreme Court, that's likewise being tested. It's dangerous for supreme directional control of an institution to be vested in a single person whose powers include the sole right to choose their successor. The role of the church in the selection process needs to be more considerable than simply affirming the previous leader's choice. So let me offer that there are going to be any number of ways to give the discernment process constitutionality in the future. So one possible example would be to have leading councils, mission centers, teams, and auxiliaries of the church put forward names to the membership as a whole for prayerful study and consideration. Thereafter, their will could be expressed through their delegates to the World Conference, who could elect future prophet presidents to six-year six terms, perhaps employing a modern instant runoff consensus system. So whether it is, um, whenever this happens, it will not be during this, continue this process, but for the next, it's my hope the community of Christ can find a way to move from being a people with a self-appointed prophetic monarchy to become a sacred prophetic commonwealth, mindful of inclusion, with empathy for all, whose responsible governance, vested in the World Conference, discerns who is being called to lead. Thank you. So I want to thank uh, people who have been donating already uh, into the lecture here. So to Philip DeNoto and uh, What Is This Thing, who have both uh, uh, came and visited our uh, very kind of interesting you know, internal look that we have here in our uh, own tradition, Community of Christ. I want to also mention that um, this lecture is, again, like I say, sponsored by uh, and is a forum of the John Whitmer Historical Association and you can uh, donate to the John Whitmer Historical Association on their website, jwha.info slash donate. Um, so now we'll go into a Q&A, but I think I'm going to get a drink of water first. So Objective Ethics asks, what do you mean when you use the term prophet? Do they have superpowers like prophets in the Bible? superpowers like interpretation of dreams, seeing the future, performing magic, et cetera, et cetera. So no. So the idea of um, prophets that are engaged like that in, in the Bible, this is usually, um, there's two different types of prophets in the Bible. Uh, one is a literary prophet uh, who is being written about in the, written about in the, um, uh, in the present and there, there's a character that existed in the past. And because ancient people did not understand how causation worked, they didn't understand the difference between uh, natural and supernatural. Supernatural is a modern word. They didn't have that idea. They understood that God or the divine is involved in all things. And, um, and so writing, uh, writing literarily, they uh, do things like you're calling performing magic. Uh, and, in, and so those kinds of, those kind of powers are literary. The kind of prophet, the other is another kind of prophet though, um, in the, in the Bible, which is the prophet who is uh, a contemporary writer who is telling the people, um, if we continue down this path, if we continue to only just uh, follow rules ritually instead of taking care of widows and orphans, if we continue to uh, break oaths or do these things, we will be ruined as a people. And so that is uh, the role of a prophet. And then also in the Bible, a prophet's role is speaking truth to power, so, for example, the prophet is an outsider who comes and criticizes the king and because uh, he is speaking on behalf of the people through, uh, who are supported by God uh, in order to tell the king that he has um, acted unjustly. Um, a difference between uh, that kind of prophet and the prophets that we have in Community of Christ, since the prophet is the leader, it is very difficult for the leader to uh, speak truth to power. Uh, instead, you have to have people like historians like me speaking some truth to power in this way, but instead the, um, the prophet has to be a little bit pragmatic and when they are bringing inspired counsel to the church, it has to actually speak for all factions of the church, which has um, 
in an interesting tradition and community of Christ. So it's no, it's not about um, superpowers or even seeing the future. It's rather saying things like, if we continue to act in this way, uh, human-made climate change will destroy the planet. We need to make urging, urging change. That's what we would mean by a prophet. Uh, Galerio Deckel says, what are your thoughts on the church's encouragement not to discuss uh, amongst one another who they, we feel is best being called to the president of the church? Um, so I think that there is a... Um, uh, an idea that we we have to understand when we're when we're engaged as a prophetic people that this should not turn into a factional political exercise like uh, like we do in in our our national elections or our, our state and provincial elections because when we get involved in this kind of factionalism it is um, uh, we're thinking only of our own interests or our own ideologies and we are thinking of uh, enemies in, in competing political camps. Uh, instead, when we are called into um, a global discernment, when we are being called to be a prophetic people, we're, we really are supposed to be trying to think of ourselves individually as the body of Christ and what God is calling for the whole body as opposed to me narrowly getting my, my way or my faction's way and that kind of a political process. And so hopefully we are doing all of that. And so not knowing how to keep people from immediately zipping lightning to, you know, like leading, well, our leader in Canada here is, is great. We love our apostle. He should be the, the next president. Rather than picking out names and kind of yelling names at each other, I think that there was a, a goal there of trying to get people to, um, to think of qualities and to, to think of the whole body. I don't know if it's been an effective um, uh, encouragement. I think that my experience, anyway, when I go and visit members of the church, they'll immediately ask, so who do you think should be the next? <laughs> so I, I find that, um, that it's pretty common that people are um, talking about uh, ideas for who it should be. Uh, 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 Galerio also asks, uh, secondly, who do you feel is being called to be the next president? Well. Um, You've mentioned that the policy is that I'm not supposed to say that, and so I won't do that in a public forum. So, so I think I've been, uh, but I have, I've been thoughtfully discerning on this and praying on this and thinking about it a lot, and I am actually have been blessed to uh, be able to know very well many of our um, apostles and other leaders. There are so many people who are very qualified, and um, and I definitely have had. Uh, personal feelings of a sense of calling. We, as we, when you have that, we are being um, encouraged now in this stage by the Council of Twelve that if you have a sense of that calling, you should write that down and send it to the Council of Twelve, uh, which is where the focus is going to be. And I'm kind of feeling like I should do that because I have a real sense for someone. Um, and there's a third part here of the question. Lastly, do you uh, feel the direction of the church moving forward will be to decentralize and maybe de-emphasize the role of the first presidency? The current first presidency, um, I think, has had a probably been about the most centralized in history. So when we look at this supreme directional control that F.M. Smith was trying to establish, there were a lot more checks and balances than the other councils of the church back then. Um, I think, and in fact, even though he got the supreme directional, con directional control through, um, the depression and the financial problems kind of meant that ultimately the first, uh, the presiding bishop work was able to take back a lot of power, and they were and they were still maintaining a lot of power up through the 1960s. Uh, and so I do think that there has been a concentration of supreme directional control into the first presidency in the last couple decades that are, is more substantial than previously. Um, I do think that there will be some. Uh, decentralization as a natural reaction to that. And also in terms of the CVZ's policy of the last decade has been to work on developing um, general decentralization as there are fewer headquarters resources, uh, areas of the church like the church here in Canada has been very much encouraged to work on uh, developing local systems. Um, Christian Anderson writes, I'm surprised uh, that you didn't discuss democracy or republicanism 
as a path to legitimacy? Do you see common consent as a pathway? So you probably wrote that question earlier in, the, in, the, in my thing because I got, at a certain point I got there, right? So yes, absolutely. Um, common consent was there right at the very beginning. Uh, and I didn't mention it as much at the beginning, but it was is certainly part of it. And then um, that has become very much emphasized in uh, Community of Christ in the last couple decades. Um, Christian Anderson also says, historians speaking truth to power have a better, better track record in some traditions than others. Well, we'll see how, how good that tradition is <laughs> you know, tonight. <laughs> Uh, Hazel McDonald said, thank you. This is an answer to my prayers. Many questions have popped up through my own personal discernment practice. This has provided me with important context and further clarity of our past and our present process and as a means to looking forward. Well, Hazel, I'm so happy that you've had that reaction. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, that's kind of my goal here. I, um, in some ways in doing this, and this is my own analysis as a historian, uh, but I'm just, uh, I've not been pulling punches because I think that we're at a critical time and we have, to act, you know, we have to be very thoughtful as we act this next tenure. If the next president was going to be in office for the next 20 years, that will, we will, that will cross a time th threshold when the church as it had previously existed will not exist that way anymore. Um, and I, what I mean by that is if you are in the member of the church in North America and other areas that, where the church's long heritage and developed, you know very well that uh, your congregation locally is likely, uh, if you think, if you add 20 years, how many of those people that are still there are gonna still be with us? And so there will be a vast uh, transformation, the time where, uh, Steve, Steve Easy's even said, the time to act is now. Uh, Rain Weber says, what would a democratic monarchy even look like? Well, so uh, a constitutional monarchy is, Canada is a constitutional monarchy, uh, and which is democratic. So we have a, 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 it's a fully democratic monarchy. So in other words, the head of state is, is simply um, mostly ceremonial. Uh, in Canada, totally ceremonial. In, in, in the UK, I would say mostly ceremonial. Um, but I'm not actually even, probably what well, I wasn't even calling for at the end there, I was saying probably not a, it's an, ele an elective monarchy with, with, where, where potentially the monarch is elected to terms. And so it might look like a person who uh, is elected to a six year term, the, the world conferences occur every three years. This is just an idea, it doesn't have to, I mean, however it all would all emerge, but one idea would be, you know, they could, in, and then reelected to another six year term. So, uh, they would be able to have the same kind of a long-standing thing, but there would be some kind of a recourse in case the um, in case the person kind of goes nuts. I mean, the, where it is right now, if it, it could be that if it was one person picks somebody who seems like the best person in the world, but once they're in charge and there's no check or balance, how can that? Um, the only check or balance is whether they live or die. <laughs> you know, if they have, if they have supreme directional control. Um, Bruce Nelson says, I absolutely honor the courage of your talk today, Brother John, and it gives me great hope for the future of Community of Christ. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for saying that. Um, like I said, I haven't said this um, to, uh, I haven't said, I've said this as my own personal ideas as a historian, my own personal analysis, and I brought this up only to, only because I think that we're at such a critical moment that I wanted to, um, you know, make this case. And uh, I think that we are very likely to emerge through this process uh, with an amazing successor to President Vesey. Um, and, and I'm very happy that that, will, that process will also not be a step back in terms of the appointment since we will um, be now mirroring the same succession process that we did back in 2004.